I am so happy to have Cam McQuaig joining us today. So Cam is currently the Head of Geoscience Excellence in BHP's Resource Centre of Excellence. And Cam's career has taken him to 43 countries on six continents, working in a wide variety of commodity systems and mineral deposits, from discovery through to production. And with his expertise, it is going to be awesome to get his insights into AI, geoscience and the mining value chain. And yes, thanks so much, Cam, for joining. It's amazing having you. Well, thanks so much. Um, also like to um, acknowledge the traditional owners. I'm on uh, Wichuk Nunyar land in, uh, in Perth. Uh, and so today I was gonna have a, a chat with you about um, a very personal view really of uh, AI through the value chain with, uh, there's been a real explosion of uh, not just AI technology, but of uh, groups that are look, seeking to employ it in various aspects of life, obviously. And one of them is through the, the minerals industry. I'll also just preface this and you'll see in the footers of the slides, um, this was a keynote that was given uh, in May at the Oz IMM, uh, uh, mineral resource and estimation conference and I want to acknowledge my uh, co-author on it who is Ilner Miniakmatov and he's our global principal for uh, data and numerical modeling in um, in BHP uh, and uh, and definitely the person with the maths so just a disclaimer saying that really this is what I'm saying is my opinion basically so I want to be quite open and frank about uh, uh, views on AI. And, and with that, I'm, I'm also looking at AI largely as a consumer of, um, of it in the sense that uh, I'm, I'm looking to inform decisions and use AI to so. And so the groups that we're talking to that are bringing AI to us uh, and the AI that we're doing internally in the company is largely done with me on the, on the framing the problem and then consuming the results end of, uh, of the spectrum. So just a bit of context to start out um, that I wanted to put out there, and I'll talk a little bit about these more through the talk, is one is, is, is that exploration is getting more difficult, and that's largely because our, our search space at the surface of the earth is depleting. In just statistical terms, we're sampling without replacement, and so um, the search for, for larger prizes and new mineral districts is progressively moving under into more challenging areas. And a lot of those are areas that are undercover that were largely blind to our, uh, our traditional exploration package. Uh, and at the same time, uh, our existing global resource base is getting more difficult. Um, you know, our, our pits are getting deeper, high walls are getting higher. Um, when we look at things like underground mass mining, uh, we're, uh, we're, we're really pushing the envelope in, in terms of how much we can produce. And I'm, and I'm talking as an industry. Um, so there's a lot less latent capacity that sits in the system, trying to optimize everything uh, right, to the, right to the wire. Uh, and, and so therefore things are becoming higher risk. And what that requires is that we have knowledge of the in situ rock mass, the subsurface, right? uh, understand its inherent variability and the uncertainty around our knowledge of that variability to inform business decisions. So we need to front load geological understanding much better in the industry uh, to you know, mitigate the risks, unlock the value. And then with all of that, no question, we've got an increasingly data rich future. And the, you know, it's, it's, we're well beyond the point now where the, the rate at which we can generate data far outstrips our ability to integrate, interpret, and turn it into knowledge for business decisions. I, I mean, you look at when, when I was, going through my studies as a geoscientist, getting chemical data was a big process. <laughs> you had a big process of sampling, preparing, doing the analyses to get the numbers. Now we're getting real-time data uh, pretty much at the, at the drill rig. We've got labs at rig. We're, you know, we're, we're getting um, 
just reams of reams of information. And as we go into things like um, harnessing more geophysics to understand the subsurface of minerals, then that's another order of magnitude or more in, in data volumes that we're dealing with. So clearly, AI has a role to play. And I want to put that out there. I am a fan of, of AI in the process. But at the same time, and as we'll talk about through the talk, we, we want to think about where, where is AI helping us at the moment? And where is AI still challenged? And we've got to be um, careful not to fool ourselves when we look at um, applying AI. And this has come out recently in discussions around um, uh, chat GPT, uh, where uh, while it can be incredibly helpful, it can also be incredibly misleading and it depends on how you apply it. So just to clarify, when I say the value chain, I'm talking about the whole value chain from exploration and discovery of a resource right through to what does the mine site look like a hundred years after it's closed right? and everything in the middle as you um, make decisions about how to mine it, the actual act of mining, processing, producing product, and then sustainably disposing of, of waste materials. And, and I, I break it into, into four main bins. One is, is that exploration and discovery side. The second one is around resource appraisal and planning. So that's modeling of the subsurface to make decisions about how to extract and what to, what to do to unlock the value. The actual act, the dynamic act of actually doing the extraction and the processing, and then the closure side. And on the bottom of that diagram, that, that from left to right, as I described there, shows the relative proportion of BHP geoscientists. And the number sits at around 700. And, and my estimates are a few years out at the moment. Um, so, and there's been some changes, so, so, but it sits at a, probably around that 700 plus or minus a fair bit. Uh, but the, the general shape is accurate in terms of um, lots in the middle, a fair bit at the front end, and an increasing number now coming at the, at that back end, that closure bit. So a bit on the expiration challenge. So. As I said, exploration is moving um, undercover. The diagram at right, you've probably seen many, many times. And the reason is, is because it's, um, it gives a good reflection of the challenge. And what it is, is a map of Australia that's color coded by um, the solid colors are depth to economic basement. Now that economic basement depends on what you're looking for and who you are, because some people's cover is other people's resource. And I understand that but this is depth to crystalline basement. And it also shows deposits colored by depth to the top of mineralization. And what we see is, is that most deposits correlate pretty one-to-one -one with areas of outcrop or subcrop. And that's because that's what our exploration package our technology package that we employ is optimized to do is to find in these areas. And as you go into the areas under cover, there's, there's clearly going to be a lot of value there, but it's costly. It's, it's higher to explore per unit area. Um, the prize hurdles are larger in terms of what's going to be economic at various depths. And when you, when you combine on, in concert with that, the fact that ground access is increasingly more challenging, license to operate is uh, is is always more challenging uh, and more complex. It it means that it's it is much higher risk, but really high reward if successful. So focusing our people, time, and money into the areas with the highest probability of success is a is an even more critical first step. Because if we go into the wrong areas, doesn't matter how good we are in terms of our exploration process, it's not gonna be there to find. And it's gonna be expensive. 
to find that out. So what we want to do is make that first decision well. So how can AI help us in that space? And that's really the big question is, can AI help us with that challenge? When you come into the actual mining process, we're in a situation where we've, we've automated a lot of processes. For example, we've, we've um, taken people out of the line of fire by automated and now we're getting a lot of automated information coming from the drill holes. We're measuring while drilling to get physical parameters. We've got downhole assay tools, uh, real-time geochemistry at, uh, um, uh, from uh, uh, you know labs at rig. So we're getting these fire hoses of information that we're then trying to collate in ever-increasing computing power. Uh, doing automated interpretation, um, getting towards real-time model updates, and then at the very bottom, um, what uh, into the future we foresee looking at um, harnessing geophysics a lot more in and around the mine to, to go from sampling pencils in space and quantifying them and using geological rules and geostatistics to get a picture of a volume of rock to actually using geophysics to sample volumes of rock, getting information on the volume calibrated to those pencils and getting a much better view of the rock mass. Right? And then that, as I said before, brings you up a whole new level of data challenge. Right? And then you're going into the petabytes of information that you're trying to move around, process, et cetera. And so trying to fuse all that information and get knowledge out of it that you can then a knowledge product that you can make a decision on is a real challenge and so how can ai help us in that space so where's ai helping so if you look at the left hand side the the diagram just shows the different uh, some different subsets of of ai from general ai which is any technique that's using a computer to help you make the decision to machine learning, to deep learning. And with all of these, it's, I think it's important to step back and say, what is it that AI actually does? And it doesn't matter how complex the algorithms, they're essentially doing one of two things. They're either doing classification or categorization, right? It's a face, it's not a face, that type of uh, effort. And, and there's areas where that is really going to help us in the future and is helping us, starting to help us now. For example, core logging, um, it helps to remove subjectivity. So the days of me saying it's 10% pyrite and then some geologist tapping me on the shoulder and saying, uh, Cam, it's actually chalcopyrite and it's more like 5%, those days are gone, right? The, 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 they'll, because we'll have quantitative reproducible data on core that we can get as we scan multi-spectral along these cores. Um, uh, similarly, uh, feature classification in, in large complex data sets, be it the core or be it large geophysical data sets to be able to segregate and classify parts of images or data sets in that sense. Um, so that's, that's a very powerful um, aspect of AI, that classification. The other one is regression. And regression is simply you have a bunch of independent variables that come together, and then you have an outcome. They contribute to an outcome, right? a dependent variable. And as you keep having inputs and getting outputs and inputs and getting outputs, you can form a regression. And then you can make a relate, you regress and find the relationship between the dependent variable and the independent inputs, the outcomes and the inputs. And examples there would be performance of time series data. Um, you could look at truck usage hours, you can do anything, but in, in, um, in geoscience, an example would be input material to a processing plant versus the output. So that over time, you'd be able to see what's going into the plant, what's coming out. You learn from that. Every time you get an output, you learn, and then you can start to do a regression to say, if I have certain combinations of inputs, I expect a certain output. Uh, another example uh, in the geoscience would be uh, coal quality. 
So if I want to, uh, as an example, if I want to um, find out the quality of coal, of coking coal, um, and I have a number of seams, one hole might cost me $100,000 to get that data. And it might take me as much as 18 months, depending how the industry is going at the, mo at the time. And so if I could find proxies that I could use at or near the hole for a fraction of that to get 80% of the answer, that would be quite useful. Right? And then that would be, a, that would be one of AI. Could you, you could use that to uh, regress that information. And then you can combine the two by having in situ classification of expected performance. So you, so you could get much better understanding of the in situ rock mass from your core logging using the classification. You could then be measuring outputs of the plant every time you put certain blocks of ore through the plant. And eventually you could get a regression where you've got the categorized data, the resource estimate, and then you can basically be able to predict what's gonna come out the other end. Right? So that would be an example where AI is using both. So lots of room for AI to add a lot of value. I've just given a couple of examples. I'm sure as I was speaking, people had a number of other examples coming into their head. So uh, the the end end geometallurgy I think is a is a really good one, and it's it's because we can get a big training set, right? So we can get we can have. Uh, an input from our model, we've got a certain tons, grade, mineralogy. We put it through the plant and we can sample it on belts. We can see what's going into the plant and we get an output. And we could do that sampling on a yearly, quarterly, monthly, weekly, daily, hourly, whatever you want. You know, you could get a sample of stuff going into and out of a plant and eventually get a large experience set that you can actually then regress, a large training uh, data set that you can regress. And a great example, this is from uh, Kathy Erig, who's one of the world's um, greatest geometallurgists at Olympic Dam. She's done absolutely exceptional work over time, her and the Olympic Dam team, uh, where when they look at a model, they can not only get the mineralogy from chemistry now, because they've got enough data, but they can then start to make predictions as to how that's going to perform in the plant through, you know, what's it going to mean for my reagents in certain parts of the plant through to what's my concentrate going to look like and basically start to put value on blocks of rock. So, and AI has, has it would have, is have going to have a massive uh, impact on our ability to do that deposit to deposit into the future. So that's a great example of where I think it has real, real value even now. Where is AI challenged? And AI becomes challenged when you move into spatial data sets. When you start to go geospatial, <coughs> other than just time series, it takes, um, it, it takes just, just statistics and, and, uh, and it takes AI into a, a whole new world of hurt really. And the reason are is that number one, in um, you've got sparse training points, you've got uh, variable resolution of your data sets, or, or representativeness of data points, because you've got one sample, and you don't know how well that is actually representing the rock around it, but before you get to your next sample, at whatever spacing that is. Uh, it um, you, you need a spatial model still to connect and predict between your data points. Right? In geostats, we use variography. So you still need some sort of spatial, um, yeah, spatial model to, do the, to connect the dots. And the, the algorithms, as they iterate through, can find spurious correlations then they, that then get reinforced in subsequent iterations. So you can have spurious correlations that the AI starts to think are super important and actually aren't. 
overfitting is really common. So, and, and what that means is that you've got way more data sets and data than you've got training, like truth, actual uh, outcomes to learn against. And so um, you you get into what's called overfitting, so that you see what you want to see, in a way, and you get a false sense of precision, and unwinding the machine learning process to find the dependencies in specific data sets is actually very hard. It's not straightforward. So knowing what is the lever that's causing that outcome, what's the sensitivity, is difficult. In exploration, um, one of the challenges is that AI is fundamentally an interpolation exercise. It's, a, it's, it's, it's you're deducing between points, whereas, whereas exploration is actually an extrapolation exercise. You're looking outside of your data sets and it's much more of an inductive uh, process. And it's also a challenge in an extremely complex system. You've got multiple parameters, it's 3D, it's multi-scale, and you've got the aspect of geological time on, on top of that, that are all hard to represent into the machine learning process, especially the multi-scale geological time. So what I wanna do is I wanna give you an example of where we did um, an exercise trying to apply AI to, to targeting. And so you can see on the left-hand side, we've got an area that's about 800 kilometers by at the widest point, a couple hundred kilometers. And we've got a number of data sets over the area. The, the ultimate outcome, obviously, that we want is the, is the targets, data-driven targeting aids. But then the subset, the bottom right, is we want insights. What are we learning from trying to do this? Okay, so th this is the basically the process without going into detail. We, we looked at um, uh, gridding the data at a, at a, at a range of, of uh, resolutions and then engineering a lot of features so that we actually do a lot of derivative spatial data sets from the input data sets. We then look at them against the training data sets. You select a subset which you then go into doing your, your models and you get an aggregated model of the prospectivity on the, on the right-hand side. So you can see that from a, a couple of hundred um, data sets, in, input data sets, we could engineer a couple hundred thousand uh, feature sets, which then we looked at against the training data and selected sets that went into the model. Now, the, the issue here we found was that the data was way overfit. And by that, I mean, we had 100 data sets that we were, that we were um, using, but in the area, there's really only 10 deposits that we would be interested in having, right? So it's um, the issue here is we don't have the experience data set, right? Because it's not made for big data. So for example, to, to illustrate this, I use the, the, the game Super Mario, right? There is an algorithm that plays Super Mario better than any human being. How did they do that? Well, in using the AI, they gave it three objectives. The first one was, uh, maximize your life. The second one was uh, get through a level as fast as you can so that you don't just like stand at the beginning and not die. And then the third one is uh, maximize your points as you go through, right? So you can give it those types of objectives, prioritize in that order. And so what, is the, what does the AI do? It starts playing the game and it dies. It goes another two seconds, it dies. It goes another couple seconds, dies. Another, and each time it goes through, it dies. It does that a million times, right? Or more. And each death is an experience point. So that by the end, I know that I've got this big experience data set that I can then optimize 
against my independent inputs as I go through. And I can actually have an algorithm that now plays Super Mario better than any human because I have a big experience database um, and, and, and I can navigate through that. The issue here is, is we don't have a big experience data set, uh, database. And that's the, that's the challenge when people go to apply AI, they say, oh, I've got massive data sets. Clearly this is uh, uh, a, uh, a place for AI. AI is not built for big data sets. It's built for big experience sets. I need to know the outcome. And if I have a big outcome database, I can then optimize to understand how to deal with inputs. Here, we had 10 deposits. So that's like saying to the computer, we want you to play expiration better than any human being, but you only get 10 tries, right? Not a million deaths like in our Super, uh, super Mario. And so what we really found was that the biggest insights were at the bottom right there. It was the analytical insights, uh, insights about data and patterns. Where was their common structure in the data? It was more the categorization side of things that ended up becoming a very powerful aspect. So as I said, so, so resource modeling is actually in the same. So there's a lot of um, groups looking at AI with resource modeling at the moment. And one of the challenges is that resource modeling, again, is not a big experience data set. Right? So if I'm looking at faces, for example, I've got a database of millions and millions of faces. And each of them have some similar features. You know, they're roughly oval. They've got two ears, two eyes, and one nose, one mouth. Right? So you've got some basic rules that you're uh, applying. However, I've got really relatively a handful of sparse data from unique deposits with different features when I'm trying to do the resource side. And they all have enough variation that they're unique. There's no, there's, there's very few common principles. So key aspects of, of limitations for AI and the resource side are listed on the left, on the left side. So number one is non-stationarity or representativeness. So the, representative of one, the representativeness of one data point for, to the volume of rock around it until you get to the next data point is highly uncertain. And you need spatial models to be able to understand how well you can join the dots. Uh, and this example here, if, I, if um, this is from, uh, this is real data actually. Um, and humans have this, tr this problem too, right? So what are you gonna do? If, you, if you're given this and you say, join the dots, you, you'd say that in the, the, the high grade in that oval is likely connected. And in reality, there's two separate channels up at that. Uh, up at that area, right? So we, we have the, the, there's a reason why geostatistics provides some degree of smoothing in the data. It's given you an estimate, right? It's a probabilistic estimate rather than a deterministic, here's what your model is, right? And when you get these ultra granular outputs, that's when you, that's when you end up being concerned because if you did for example conditional simulation you could find a range of possibilities that would honor this right so uh and we don't we don't have the null data points to uh and the experience data set to be able to do these in in great detail yet in resource estimation but in the future um the ai is helping us find common structure in data. It's helping us synthesize multi-parameter, multi-dimensional, because you know, humans can think okay in three dimensions. Um, a computer can think in as many dimensions as you want. 
uh, and uh, where we're looking to do some uh, automation of the process. So auto domaining and finding stationarity, right? That's definitely, uh, uh, that would be great. We've got audio variograms going already, right? And now what we're, now what we're looking for is can we actually use the AI to help us understand and find stationarity? So there's steps towards a future where AI could do your resource estimate, but we're a ways away from that at the moment. So when I think of, of, of uh, using how we use data, I really think of it in this type of learning loop, right? So you start with an idea, start from the top and you say, I've got an idea, right? I see some pattern and I, I wanna understand What's the underlying process that controls the pattern? What's the next data set I need to resolve possibility A versus possibility B, right? So what's the question I'm asking? I then get data, I pull it together, I analyze it, right? So that's the data architecture at the bottom. I analyze it, which is on the left-hand side. I find emergent patterns, and then it puts me to the other side of the, of the triangle again, and that is, What's that pattern mean, right? What's the underlying process, right? So this deductive inductive loop is really what we're, what we're trying to optimize and use AI for on the uh, left-hand side. And oh, sorry, on that too, um, what we find is, is that if where AI has been helpful is when we get data architects data scientists and domain experts in the same room. If you just come with the data science, that's not enough, right? You need to have the, the how, do you, how do you have the architecture to ingest all these streams of data that are continually coming at us? And how do you have the domo domain expertise that actually frames the challenge and provides context and QAQC against outputs, right? And then when you lock the three of those in a room and tell them they can't come out until they come up with the answer, you get some results, right? If you just have two or one of them, you're unlikely to be you're, you're, uh, as successful. So I just take away on this slide, those three things, right? Domain expertise, data architects, and the, um, the data scientists. So uh, when we look at when we look at AI now, you know, in 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 the geosciences, we're still in the augmented intelligence phase where we're we're maximizing human human intuition, but minimizing human bias. Right. So we're we're uh, we're, we're trying to optimize the good things that the human brain does in terms of intuiting through gaps in data, the, that, did, that inductive process, but minimizing the, the heuristics and biases influence uh, through the power of, of uh, machine learning. So when you look at where machine learning is now, you know, data analytics, data science, the deep learning and inference, definitely. But the human-like reasoning the cognitive engine where the computer is asking the question, we're a ways away from that now. We, we, we are still the ones asking the question. And so it's important to understand that that's where we are in the, in the evolution here. So in that presentation, hopefully I've given a bit of a view of AI um, through the value chain where I think it's really helpful at the moment already, where I think it's challenged um, and, and, and where it needs to be into the future. So hopefully that's been, uh, been helpful. And thanks everybody for your time.